so well. Uh, I, I'd also like to say that um, in my years in Brookline, of course, I've I, I voted in, in the past overrides, and having spent the time that I, I have with the 2014 report, I now realize that I was voting on just pure heart on what I just thought was right and had no sense of all of the issues involved with the meaning of my vote. And I would like to do better this time, and I will do better whether, I, you know, whether I'm on the committee or not. But I would certainly hope that we will find a way uh, to help the citizens of Brookline um, become more um, involved and, 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 and better informed about um, the repercussions of, of, of that vote. Um, I see that you have an educational, is it a, a doctorate? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I have a doctorate in education, yes. Yes. Um, so that kind of perspective for this kind of purpose, uh, a lot of the override tends to be very school and uh, school program specific. Would you be able to um, understand some of the stuff that the school committee puts forward and help the rest of the study committee understand like how that translates into dollars? I think so. Um, uh, a good part of my work in higher education, I was at the Boston University School of Medicine for 25 years before becoming the vice president at the Association of American Medical Colleges in Washington, D.C. And one of my areas was student finance. And my doctoral dissertation was the development of a student financial planning model for the highest cost institution of, of higher learning in America. And at that time, it was the Boston University School of Medicine. Um, <laughs> I've also done a great deal of work um, on the board at Colby College. And um, at Colby College, you know, we are on time and on budget institution. And I work <laughs> deeply with the vice president of finance um, around all of the issues of that institution. So, I, I, you know, I'd have a learning curve, but, but I think I, I, I could. Well. Excellent. No, I was just going to gonna ask you, following up on uh, select woman's <laughs> uh, Hamilton's uh, question, uh, to sort of give us some some understanding of how your background, not in finance but in education, and we're talking about schools anyway, uh, would provide an important uh, contribution to the co uh, committee. But I think you've answered that. Um, but uh, if you want to well, it, it, elaborate it, some more. It may be perspective. Um, I, I, I believe um, deeply in education, which is why I provide uh, free advising um, to all comers. And I, I, I'm very, very proud of what Brookline um, does with its, with its school system. And although I um, have not had my own children in the system, I believe that in this country, until we begin to take the responsibility for educating all of our children, then we are still going to be faced with some of the issues that we are faced with now. My godchildren, two extraordinarily wonderful African-American young men, went through the Brookline public school system. And both they, their parents, and I talk about how incredibly valuable that experience was for them and I think how valuable they were for uh, the Brookline um, public schools. And I, I, I think education has been the cornerstone of, 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 of my life and I think I will bring perspective and the ability to listen, to learn, and to try to appreciate the balances that we will need to achieve between continued school excellence and town services and the ability, particularly for the lower income and, 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 and the elderly, um, to be able to afford, and renters, to remain in our town. Okay, no. so I'll follow up on select person Green's um, question. Um, so it, it, it appears that you've had a very successful career in the educational arena, and I'm wondering whether you have any familiar, familiarity at all with municipal finance and town services as you have just. Not, not directly, no. Okay. 
But I can attest, since we worked on the town meeting members association <laughs> together, that Charles is an excellent listener. Well, what I've tried to do <laughs> in my year and a quarter as a town meeting member, I'm generally pretty outspoken, is that I've tried to remain very quiet, to learn, to listen, to meet people, and to uh, moderate uh, some of the opinions that I tend to walk into the door with. Um, so you've not heard very much from me because I think I've been fairly successful with doing that. <laughs> Okay, so th thank you very much for applying. I think we'll be making decisions in the next week or two. Thank you very so much. Week. Next <laughs> week. Next week. <laughs> next week. Okay. Ooh, ha have a good evening. October already. It's like when Franco banged the table. <laughs> it's for dramatic effect. It's, <laughs> it's going to be next week. Is uh, Ariel uh, Seifer here? Ah, Mr. Seifer, did I did I mangle your name? <laughs> you, you won't be the first or the last. So, so Ariel is great. Okay, T tell me how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Soifer. So that, that was fine. Uh, that wasn't too bad. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell us about yourself and uh, sure. what brings you here. Um, so I um, am a lawyer at uh, Wilmer Hale, uh, formerly Hale and Door downtown. Um, my focus is on tech transactions. In a prior life, I was a management consultant focusing on. Um, financial modeling, data analytics. Um, what brings me here today is I think that I have, you know, the right kind of both financial and legal analytical abilities. Um, I obviously couldn't act as a lawyer in uh, this role, but and we I wouldn't have, expect you to. Right, <laughs> but uh, but but I have I think the right kind of analytical abilities to contribute to the override study committee and to think about um, the issues here. Um, I think I have, a, you know, a good background to help out here, and I'm happy to do so. I've previously um, been on a couple of town committees uh, several years ago, and I'm hoping to start to um, get back involved. So, which uh, which committees uh, were you on? I was involved in the wireless committee. Um, oh. <clears throat> excuse me, when we first uh, deployed townwide Wi-Fi, which maybe was a decade ago or so, and the yeah. IT advisory committee it was a good idea. Time. Yeah, you know it. For its time. For its time, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, separately I was on the IT advisory committee for a few years um, after that as well. Okay. Questions? So I see that you have extensive financial modeling experience. Yes. Can you elaborate on what that is and how it might benefit this type of uh, committee? Sure. So um, I've built financial models for Fortune 500 companies. It's been a few years, but I have done that. And um, some of that was things like trying to figure out uh, how to calculate your revenues, uh, how to forecast what the revenues would be for the next five years or 10 years, and um, what are the right ways to build that financial model to account for different assumptions, how to, how to run um, different kinds of models to uh, say, well, let's say this assumption varies by 5%, 10%, what is the impact on the revenues or the you know, overall balance sheet for the firm? Um, those are the kinds of things I've done. I think it's fairly obvious how that would apply to um, the, the goals here, but I can, I'm happy to elaborate on it if, you know, if that's helpful. Well, so let's say you see a financial model. Would yes. you be able to ask questions about the underlying assumptions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm very comfortable doing that, and, and you know, that's what I used to do in my old life. So I'm a little rusty, but I, I think I could pick that up again. Um, it's I, like riding a bicycle. <laughs> I think so, and um, you know, I'm, I, I think that that's something that we're all trained to do as part of financial modeling, mm -hmm. um, to think about the assumptions, to think about how they might vary and what the impact might be. Um, that's and typically, I mean, you know you have to make assumptions whenever you're making a model, so then the idea is, well, what happens if those assumptions are wrong? And you hope that they're within a narrow band of your initial assumption, but they're not always. Okay. Talk to us about how you would convey that to other members of the committee, making sure that they appreciate both the values as well as the potential risk of using financial models um, in a particular situation. Sure. So th that was something that we did in my old job as well. Um, 
sometimes we use PowerPoint presentations, which aren't always viewed in the highest light. Um, but <laughs> one, of, one of the things that um, I tried to become an expert in, and I think I reasonably succeeded, was translating things from what I would call statistician ease to you know, English. Um, and trying to get things into relatively simple English. And, and I think that that's the sort of thing that would apply here. So for example, you might say, well, okay, if, um, if we vary this assumption by plus 10% or minus 10%, then the bottom line impact on you know, the town's revenues or um, something will be X. And then you could have a simple chart that just says, you know, here's what it'll be for each of these assumptions. And just by looking at the magnitude of those bars, you'd have a pretty reasonable understanding of, well, here are the levers that matter. It's the sort of thing I've done before. It's the sort of thing I think I could do here. So I want to ask you about something you wrote in your application. And uh, it's a sentence that I could read a couple of different ways, so I want you to expand upon the, the thought sure. process. Uh, you say one of the issues that you'd like the board to, uh, to address is minimizing impacts on town residents. Sure. W what did you mean by that? Yeah, well, I think one of the concerns, not just for current town residents, but also future town residents, is what the, the overall picture here is. I think Brookline, for better or for worse, has become really upper middle class and, and upper class, and it's harder and harder, I think, for middle class and non, not, not even middle class folks to um, live in this town. And I think we need to think about that, and is that something we want, and um, are there any things that we can do through this process to manage that, to try to make Brookline a town that is accessible for everyone, uh, which includes, I think, accessibility to uh, what I'd consider a world-class school system where you know, I'm happy to have my, my kids attend as well. So is that a financial statement or a programmatic statement or a combination of both? I, I would think of it more financial, I suppose, but I, I guess you could think about it as both to a lesser degree. Yeah, one, one of the things you'll discover as you as you get into this is uh, we have a big box drawn around what we can do, um, especially in the world of taxation. And uh, for better or worse, the property tax is kind of where the action is, and we can't do things like uh, it's, it's been suggested by some, things like a uh, transfer tax or uh, even an income tax, you know, if, you, if you live in New York City, mm -hmm. you pay a city uh, income tax. Or in Philadelphia, I see you were a, a Penn grad and a fellow Penn grad. Um, and Philly has a wage tax. Yep. Uh, we, we can't do that. So uh, property tax is kind of where it is. So we can hopefully search for non-tax revenue, but we're even there. We're kind of limited. You know, there's only so much you can raise the uh, parking meters. Right. I mean, if we made them a thousand dollars an hour, I'm assuming not too many folks would park in Brookline. <laughs> yeah, we only the Tesla drivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, That's right. <laughs> Any? Um, go ahead. Um, I see that you taught an alternative dispute resolution uh, yes. class. Um, what did that entail, and would that be some some sort of skill set that might? Uh, be appropriate for this setting. Um, so I'm not angry with you. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were getting along, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have any alternative dispute resolution skills, but, you know, <laughs> but I'd like to think that I do, as, as I think many lawyers like to think that they do. Um, a lot of times, you know, that's, that's our job. We both, we, we try to bring our clients closer to the other side, and tr especially I'm a corporate lawyer, so I'm doing transactions. We try to bring our clients closer to the other side and the other side closer to us, and hopefully we find a, a middle ground where we can all be reasonably unhappy. Um, in, in uh, you know, the, the specific question, the ADR class, um, I was asked by one of my professors to teach a couple of, um, I think it was over maybe two or three years to teach one class each time and just help her out with that class. And you know, um, I don't know if the actual teaching there helped, but the um, when I was in law school, we, we won the um, national negotiation competition. 
and um, I was asked to teach about uh, that negotiation competition a scenario that we had there and um, there were specifically some ethical issues that were raised by um, that scenario and so you know I spoke with the class about uh, legal ethics I know it's surprising but they exist mm -hmm. and um, we were asked to try to find um, you know, comments and, and ways to, to help the students think about those legal ethical issues, how to negotiate successfully, how to drive a good bargain, but at the same time, how to be consistent with our requirements as, as lawyers. Hmm. We're good? I'm good. Okay. Ooh, 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 oh. One last question. Okay. Shoot. Settlers of Catan. Yes. Do you call it rock or do you call it ore? Um, I do call it ore. Uh, and I understand the game is now called Catan, but I, or Catan, but I still refuse, and I use the old name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I won't even ask what that was. <laughs> it's a generational. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I recommend <laughs> trying to. <laughs> Boy, I'm, uh, I recommend. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an old fogey. <laughs> my God. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mr. De Petro. De Petro. Okay. You can, you can go your way. I think my family pronounces it wrong. But, uh, How do you pronounce it? I pronounce it Petro. Oh, I had it right. Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of people. <laughs> You're a lot getting of people the last Petro. Yeah. <laughs> so t tell us about yourself and uh, what yeah. brings you here. Sure. Um, so I live in uh, in Brookline on uh, Still Street, um, which is uh, Precinct Two, I believe. Um, I've been here for about five years. My wife and I moved here after we got married, um, and. Um, you know, we really love Brookline. Um, I think it's probably one, you know probably the best town to live in in, in Massachusetts, um, and I'm sure you all probably feel similarly. But we're biased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, so you know, I've been looking for a way to get involved for a while now. Um, I got a little bit sidetracked with uh, uh, you know having two sm two young children, but kind of coming out of the weeds, and I saw this opportunity to uh, to get involved, and um, it's it's pretty interesting because it. Um, it, it marries my professional life with my um, personal sort of uh, cares. You know, I mean, I care, I care deeply about uh, the school system and, you know, also taxes, and, and I understand the, the interplay there. Um, and, and professionally, I work in um, investment and uh, specifically real estate investment, um, so I have a pretty strong analytical background, um, uh, which I think will, you know, pair nicely uh, with this role in, in a bunch of ways. Um, uh, you know, specifically from an analytical perspective um, of financial statements and, and, and how the, the, the town's budget operates, um, but, but also um, uh, from a real estate perspective, you know, being able to look at, uh, you know, how buildings operate and how, 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 you know, being able to look deep, deeper into certain line items of, of the budget. Um, so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, hopefully participating and being an active uh, contributor on this committee. So uh, I'm curious as to whether you've had any um, um, experience with munici municipal budgets. Um, so no, I haven't had uh, any experience with municipal budgets, um, but I've had a experience with a fairly broad range of budgets. Um, you know, when my role is to go out and acquire real estate for my firm, um, and every piece of real estate is different, every seller is different, and you'd be surprised how different their operating budgets are from a revenue perspective and from an expense perspective, and mm -hmm. I have a pretty good understanding of, of that. I also um, am involved with a, a nonprofit called the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, um, where I, I, I am on the budget committee and involved in you know, a nonprofit's budget as well. What are abstracted leases? <laughs> so, uh, by the way, I didn't edit my own professional resume at all before sending it over here. But, um, <laughs> but it's basically just you know you take a uh, you take a lease, uh, which is a legal document by which somebody um, occupies space and pays rent and dictates all the roles and responsibilities. And and one of my one of the things I've done in the past I don't do as much of anymore, but um, is to read those documents and and pull out the important terms that matter when you're considering making an investment in real estate. Ooh, interesting. How do you learn how to do that? <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 so, so. I, I studied it in school, um, okay. but then I, you know, I learned, I, I learned a lot on the job, um, and it just, you know, takes a lot of, a lot of hours of grinding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh. Um, Go right ahead. Underwriting and valuation. Can you elaborate as to what that 
is. Um, sure. I'm sorry. Where 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 are you? It is the very last line in your skill section. Yes. Oh, it's knowledgeable in real estate underwriting and valuation. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So that's just you know uh, simply the the. Um, Understanding of how you calculate your um, ex your revenues and your expenses, and come down to a, a net operating income, and then figure out what you think you're going to um, pay for a piece of real estate and why, and then um, uh, kind of what the drivers are behind your assumptions, and and you know figuring out um, how how good it could get or how bad it could get based on the var different variables. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I spoke to Mr. DiPietro on the phone prior to tonight, so uh, I've had a number of my questions answered. So I'm I'm good. Okay. Oh, can uh, um, you mentioned Argus and Excel? Is Argus more like um, Access database? Uh, it is an Access database of sorts, but it's a little more polished than that and um, designed specifically for real estate uh, valuation. Uh, and you, you, uh, Excel, I'm sure you know what Excel is. Yeah. Um, so okay. those are just sort of financial related skills. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So we'll be uh, making selections next week and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you for applying. Mm -hmm. And Ms. DeWitt, we, we've seen you before. Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 Good evening, everybody. Um, I think you are all people now. Is that right? Um, we, were, we were people <laughs> before. Members, I started trying to track that. Um, we were all men prior, right? I, <laughs> I was never. <laughs> not touching that one. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm um, here in part because i horrified to realize I've been involved in every single of the town's overrides, going back to 1994. Um, I remember. And that was when I was chair of the advisory committee, and that was the first one we passed in Brookline after the statute, which was passed in 1980. So uh, I have a little um, even taken aback myself by how many years <laughs> I have had things to do with overrides. Um, but. The real reason I'm here is that I was involved more recently. I mean, I was uh, chair of the advisory committee in the night when the 1994 override was being reviewed and, and prepared. And I was involved in the process there as a member of the advisory committee. For the 2008 override, I was involved um, along with Chair Wyszynski. Um, in a process that was establishing the parameters of the override. And then for 2015 override, I had a role as co-chair of the B-Space Committee, where Chair Wyszynski also served. And um, such, such memories. So I, unfortunately, I, and I'm not saying this with prejudice, but I realized I had a lot more to do with overrides than I had originally even thought about. Um, and I know they're terribly important, and I don't think the town undertakes them lightly. Uh, I think we need to do the same sort of review process that we've done in the past, and we have good models. I guess my feeling now is we've been in a situation where we have accumulated knowledge and information and therefore we can build on all of these prior studies. Um, but I do think each one requires the same level of uh, fact gathering and analysis and, and fiscal uh, due diligence with regard to all of the way operations in the town and also whatever we're contemplating. Um, I know full well that the um, override in 2008 in part was driven by anticipated sort of changes in the community. The 2015 one was definitely being driven by enrollment increases. And we're now seeing um, another change with real estate development that may also have a future impact on enrollment. I'm not quite sure where all that fits in, but I know that we need to look very carefully uh, at where the um, drivers are 
and how we can be best prepared both for um, proper responsible operating facility, I mean, being in a position to uh, have our operations well organized and efficient, and if there are places where we can make savings because of increased technology or some other changes that had not been around at the prior um, under consideration previously, all of those things are new and things that we must deal with um, and then come up with some kind of recommendation based on our best ability to analyze the facts that are available to us. So, big task and not very much time as I understand it. Right, yeah, we're looking at I will ask my, my usual question. <laughs> I assume you've had some municipal finance experience. <laughs> um, I have reviewed a budget or two, yes. <laughs> I have, I think, good background. I am not, I will, I will give this as an absolute flat. I don't, I don't, I don't calculate, I'm not a financial person. I rely on other people's, but I have enough experience to know how to ask pointed questions and to help understand. Yeah, I'll help affirm that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and try to help people understand what the um, professional data analysis means and why we have to come to certain recommendations and conclusions based on it. But I count on my fingers. So I, and I I'll, use a calculator. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask Sorry. you a leading question. And if I admit it's a leading question, it's OK. Um, uh, you, uh, in your, um, there's a lot of angst about this, this override yes. uh, and the, the potential size of it and the number of yes. asks that are going to be going to the voters yep. uh, in quick succession. Uh, I notice on your professional uh, experiences that you are a director of the um, Community Foundation. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that role and anything that you think that experience brings to your um, your participation on past override study committees and potentially this future one. Well, I guess what I would say is that my community foundation experience and also my affordable housing experience, I, I can underline previous comments about the fact that our community is now suffering from a wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we address that. Um, I think we have an obligation to the uh, children who come to our schools. Um, and my impression is now that it's becoming increasingly expensive for the parents of those children to live here. And um, it seems to me we, we are going to have to struggle to balance these various interests. Having said that, I also think that to the extent that we undertake an override, in part if it's to be for um, expansion of the high school, for example, uh, we have to justify every penny we spend. In that case, as a debt exclusion, at least one can imagine the impact is less significant than for operating overrides, which will have a much more immediate impact. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I know in the past, when we've looked at these calculations, we've tried to um, provide an incremental impact so that the um, effect of it is somewhat mitigated. Having said all of that, the answer is if we're going to raise this kind of money and we're not talking small bucks, we're talking big bucks no matter how, uh, it will continue to be, um, it, it, will prov it will make it more difficult for families who would like to live in Brookline to live here because it will have those consequences. And I, all I can say is that I think we should mitigate them to the best of our ability and have more affordable housing. Yeah, let me, um, I, I want to ask a question, but I first want to just make an um, observation that you were born in the same town I was born in, Columbia, South Carolina. Yes, how about that? I have, okay, so anyway. I did were, marry a Midwesterner and I kind of got groomed out of my accent, though. <laughs> And you were also in Philadelphia during the time I was in high school. Oh, really? If you, if you remember anything about what I was doing, don't tell. Okay, so, <laughs> no, it's not. But anyway, it was a great uh, place. It was a good place to be then, though. I will well, have to say. It was a great place for, for a young kid like me. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> I thought you spent all your time in the this library, the, Bernard. Is this uh, the Frank Rizzo years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. It just, was. just before I was there. Just well, uh, over into, but just before Rizzo. But yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So um, separate from uh, your experience on prior o override committees and separate from all your financial expertise, blah, 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 
Um, g give me a sense of how your experience as a member of the uh, board of select whatevers um, <laughs> will play into this uh, override study committee. And I'm thinking in terms of the committee is going to report to the board, but also must convince the board. Um, so, yeah, you know, what, what, what do you bring from that experience uh, to this committee? Well, perhaps um, I can at least provide what I know to be some, and I believe uh, Selectman Wyszynski mentioned this, some of the limitations on what the Board of Selectmen can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the good news is that we have a board that can um, make difficult decisions. <clears throat> But in order to make those decisions, what I would have looked for and hope that you too will look for is a balanced rep uh, presentation of the facts and information that you need in order to be able to make the best decision. And I could imagine even that you might not in the end feel it was a perfect one, <laughs> but it has to be the best you can given the facts and under the circumstances. And it would be my hope that the way the committee works is that it provides with the best, it provides the members with the best tools to make that final determination. I have one, one question. Um, from your vast experience, having worked on overrides, the thing that stuck out for me uh, was that you had chaired the school's subcommittee when you were on the advisory <laughs> committee. So yeah. I, I can only imagine the interplay between the schools and the advisory committee. Uh, can you elaborate on what that experience was like and how that experience might help uh, the override study committee this time around? Well, it's, it's just a matter of understanding somewhat the way the school department operates independently um, as a system within a system, so to speak. Um, I will also have to say that it's been a long time since I did that, but I have also worked collaboratively with school committee members, including Ms. Heller, from time to time. Um, and my feeling is that there's got to be a fair balance. I don't always necessarily believe the school committee, uh, I mean, try it differently. The school committee is driven by um, a, a set of criteria that might be different compared to people who are trying to make a financial decision about things. And so it's really important to find out all of the information and to sort of push hard to be sure that it's, it's, it's needs and not wants that we're talking about. And I think particularly this time, uh, it may have been less critical at other times, but right now I really do believe that's very, very important. So. And I think our schools are important, you know, they're, they support our tax base. It's weird, but that's part of the whole thing here. And we oh. have so little commercial base. Right. I mean, when people compare us to Cambridge, it's really not an apples to apples. No, nope, not at all. Because they're so, so different. They have 20% to 80% that, you yeah, know. There's, they have so much commercial property and, and they seem like they're building more things all the time, so. Correct. Okay, I, I think that's it. Okay. So I think next week, uh, with the Selectman Franco banging the table, <laughs> is when we'll I, be I doing gather this. He, he's anxious to get started. Is I, that? <laughs> I've got my eye on the on the, the reporting deadline. And <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We noticed a public hearing for eight fifteen. Uh, and while it says approximate, um, I'm going to suggest we take a 10-minute yes. recess um, so we can refresh, refresh ourselves. <laughs>
soon as that one out, I, I was going to wait until we were going to make our statement tonight oh, yeah. here, uh, uh, and then we were going to send it out to the town meeting members and Facebook press or all black. So as soon as he sent that his thing, I'm thinking, okay, I got to get the word out uh, before before the train starts rolling here. Um, so I immediately sent. The thing out to so he sent something out. Earlier today, yeah, yeah. Check your. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think it, it means we're on notice. Um, right. Clear, you know. Well, he, he he told when Mel and I met. Yeah, I know you did. So and, I should have known um, what was. You know, so and, and so we, we knew that. Looks could kill. Mm -hmm. 
restaurants back then. You can sort of, yeah, you can do a kind of, um, what's the word, swap? That's not the right word. You can swap. Essentially. Yeah. You can do Somebody who wants or has a local or a geographically based one could swap with somebody who has a non geographically based one. So that so they're granting a certain percentage that are non geographically based, or is that grandfather? No, the, the ones that the, the current the old system, the current yes. system is yes. based on population with no geographic tie. Yeah. In order to increase licenses now, Not because exactly. of the legislation across the street, they have to be a certain effect economic. A.m. flight. That's all. You have a six a.m. flight tomorrow. Tomorrow. Where you going to? Oh, it's going to be really hot. Northeast. I'm sure there'll be a million reactions, right? So far, not too much. Nothing big. I only work out Facebook. Mr. Green, let's get started. And uh, we have one more interview. So uh, uh, Mr. Miller uh, is applying to be on the uh, Override Study Committee. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Well, the first thing I need to do is apologize. Um, I don't know how, but uh, somehow I had my mind that this was 8.30 and got here and realized that it was not. So <laughs> I apologize. I know you go late enough and are busy enough that, uh, you know, I appreciate your giving me an opportunity nonetheless. So thank so you. So tell us about yourself and what brings you to apply it to the committee. I would be happy to. So um, I live at 19 Copley Street. I've lived in Brookline, actually. It was surprising to me, but when I started writing this up, it's 37 years. Um, I know some of you already know this, but I have two children who graduated from Devotion and Brookline High School. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 8. I'm on the board of Climate Action Brookline, member of the Green Caucus, a CERT volunteer with the Brookline Police Department, and a teacher at the Heath School. So there's the bio portion. Um, I've been teaching in Brookline for 15 years, but most of my professional life has been in the private sector. When I first moved to the Boston area, I managed a retail store in the Prudential Center, and I've been a successful product manager for technology companies creating and managing multi-million dollar portfolios. I think that I'll be able to provide a unique perspective to the committee as someone who has knowledge of the needs and the opportunities in the Brookline community and in the Brookline schools, as well as experience managing budgets and the necessary decisions that budgets require. Um, so I think that that one of the things that is important to me in applying for the job is 
bringing creativity to the process. I think that it's one thing to put numbers into a spreadsheet and crunch them. It's another thing to try to balance competing interests. I think that if you're going to um, be successful that you have to be creative about it. So the last override study committee identified over six million dollars to catch up with past underfunding and one of the things that's important to me is I think that catching up isn't really our best strategy. Um, it's important I think to do our best to give voters a long-term view of what we anticipate and yes, you know, the further out you go, the less you really know about what's coming along. But I think that it's easier to handle small surprises than big ones. And um, probably no surprise to anybody here, but um, Americans aren't at the top of the list in being good savers. And I think that, you know, one of the things that really would help is if people felt like and, and again, this was something that the last override study committee raised as a question, not a, I don't believe that they weighed in on it, but um, said that, you know, one of the things that the town of Brookline needs to look at is, are we better off with a lot of small overrides or just a few really big ones? And I think that people are really much more comfortable if they know they're going to have smaller predictable amounts that they're going to have to be responsible for than that they really don't know what's coming and but when it gets there it's going to be big so you know that's one of the things that I don't say I have all the answers to but to me it would be really important to work closely with town committees and commissions and groups that are looking at long-term planning that are thinking about the future that are doing things like encouraging hotels or micro units or things to to help the town to become a little more predictable and a little more stable as we go forward and I think that taking that into account as well as looking at what's going on right now today and what we need in a year or two years but to try to put in place some sort of a plan that says to the community hey here's what we think we're going to be needing um, people who have moved here have moved here because they really value what we have to offer and I think that people um, would appreciate the opportunity to you know I think people would be willing to pay for what they value here in Brookline um, as is evidenced by the overrides that have been successful I just think that it would be less stress on the community and I think actually a lot less stress on this board as well as um, the town if we didn't have to sell big overrides. Um, so you know that's that's one of the the main things on my mind right now. Um, budgets represent decisions so and priorities it's not you know well we have this much money so when we run out we're we're done you have to make decisions we're we gonna spend money here we're gonna spend money here um, I think with the right combination of long-term care planning and careful study that this committee has an opportunity to establish the strong and predictable future that Brookline so desperately deserves and desires as someone deeply committed to this community, I am in a unique position to balance my knowledge about the vital interests of schools with the financial needs of the realities of the town. And, um, you know, I think that, that the other thing that I'll say in concluding is that um, when I looked at the towns around Brookline and towns that we tend to compare ourselves with, um, we've had less overheads. I think we've had three, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I think so, yeah. Three yeah. Three. Wellesley's had 23, Needham's had 30. This was as of 2014. I don't know if there have been any since then. But so there are communities that are doing vastly more overrides. So I'm not saying that we should get into the race of uh, trying to beat out 30 uh, overrides by any means, but you know, it might. I think be a really good strategy to at least offer hey we could go this way or we could go this way and so maybe instead of last time we had what was it uh, five million dollar 
and a seven million dollars. So maybe this time it should be a well, we could do X million dollars now and be good for a while, or we could go with a more modest amount and make it a more predictable. So anyway, that's that's what I am uh, thinking about and why I'm here. And again, thank you for letting sure. me. Uh, make the mistake of getting here late. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Um, I have worked with Bob in the past. I think on. I think we really worked uh, together on the last override the, yep. uh, campaign, 2014. Yep. Um, I know that you are a homeowner. Yep. Um, so I, you're a teacher, but you are also a homeowner. What kind of town services um, have you seen in the past? that you would like to see kind of maybe come back or even new services? Uh, should we have a robust discussion about balancing town services mm -hmm. and the schools? Um, and, and when I talk about the, the decision making, I think that the schools can be included in that. You know, I'm not, even though I teach, I'm not saying, oh, the schools get everything they want and then let's see what we've got left over. I mean, I think that there's room to look at both sides in terms of where to where to make decisions and how to allocate. But um, a couple of things come to mind right away. One of them is um, open space and the parks that we have. And I think people who are attracted to Brookline, I know it's true for me, really value the fact that it's not living in Boston as close as we are to Boston on three sides. Um, and part of that, I think, is that we've got neighborhood parks and we've got open space and, and it's not the same feeling. So I think, I think that's something to think about. I don't know whether that's a growth area, but maybe that's an area that we think about in terms of, and today's decision about Pine Manor maybe is a, is a, you know, an opportunity in that regard. So that's one thing. Um, and I think, you know, I think another thing that I, um, you know, I don't know that it's it's the same kind of a qualitative benefit for me as a resident, but I think that the balance of um, of the makeup of the town is an opportunity. And I think you know we have so little business, um, certainly so little office space. I guess Brookline Place is probably our premier um, um, office location. Um, but I think that there's room there in, to think about as we grow what what that means and whether we can expand some of the commercial base that we've got going on. Um, Boston is, you know, just dying for housing. You know, Boston's overcrowded. We're right here. I think for us to think that we're going to stay exactly how we are and nothing's going to change and Boston's going to burst at the seams is an unrealistic point of view. So, you know, I think that there's room for us to grow in ways that preserve that open space and the quality of life that brings people to Brookline and at the same time plan for a future that involves growth. So, I, is that what you were asking about yes. in terms of, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Select from green. <clears throat> Looking at your application form, my eyes are focused on a phrase, fiscally conservative budget. Um, I always wonder what people mean by fiscally conservative, because um, all budgets are sort of balancing acts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, value, values are in budgets. Uh, so it, it, in terms of how you're thinking about this in the context of the override study committee, um, how do you balance the various needs, both of the schools as well as the schools in the town. What, what's your sort of you know, idea, big idea with respect to that? Um, as a fiscal well, conservative. Well, first of person. all, first of all, when you read that, I was like, "Oh, did I say that?" Because <laughs> I think that using using um, what's you know slogans or catchphrases like that, you know, doesn't necessarily say what is behind it because they get so used. Um, but what I, what I was really thinking about was working in an environment where you need to understand limitations on a budget and, um, 
Actually, we, you know, this somewhat off the point, but, you know, I had a conversation with somebody today about time, you know, the time constraints in the school uh, day. And, I, you know, I, I started talking about it as a budget. You know, it's the same thing. You're budgeting time, not dollars, but you have so many hours, so many minutes. How do you divide them up? How are you going to use them? Um, and so I think that when I was talking about conservative, I was talking about it in the sense of um, not that I'm not willing to, um, you know, I think that the town should spend money on the things that are important to it. I think that it's a matter of what I was thinking about was the fact that you need to live within certain constraints. and. So I think that's the conservatism as opposed to, oh, you know, people have credit cards and they don't have to necessarily live within their constraints, but towns uh, do. So I think that's what I was thinking about. And I think the other part of your question was about how to handle that, was, um, which well, I, I mean, think... But budgets don't, are, are not conservative, liberal. They're prudent yeah. or not. They're so what? They're prudent or not. Right. So, you know, what, what, what is a prudent way of looking at uh, you know, some of these issues? Well, you know, I would, I would maybe even argue that I don't know that they're prudent or not. I think that they're decisions. So, you know, if you're only going to spend the money you have, which, you know, it's my understanding that that's our, we're required to do that, um, it's about a decision. So it's not... You know, is it a prudent? You know, I, I think that most of the decisions that the town of Brookline has been making are prudent decisions. It's a question of, um, you know, within the schools, you know, do you spend money on curriculum? Do you spend money on technology? Do you spend money on classroom uh, staff? Do you spend money, you know, where do you spend the money? And, you know, when you've used it up, then. You know, you have to come up with a budget that balances what's coming in and what's going out need to be equal. And so, you know, I think it's the same thing with the town. Um, you know, I'm not sure when you say prudent, are you talking about you want to know specific line items? No, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, a budget is not something that occurs in one moment. Something mm -hmm. that evolves over time. So, you know, January 1st. Do we fix this roof that's leaking, or do we put off that and, and spend money on something else? Um, I mean, that's more the idea of getting in. Okay, so I mean, certainly, a you know, as a homeowner, if you have a roof that's leaking, you fix that. Um, you know, do you add a porch? No, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you have the money, yes, maybe you do. You want a little space outside, and you want to be able to sit and have a barbecue. And I think it's the same for the town. You know, if there's snow plowing that needs to get done, we're going to do it. You know, we're not going to not do it. Um, you know, are we um, going to replace, um, you know, the, you know, um, the ball fields with AstroTurf if we, you know, are tight on money? Well, maybe that's next year's project. So. I mean, I think some things are discretion more discretionary and some things are less discretionary and a leaking roof to me is not a discretionary item. So, Heller. So, um, Bob, what motivated you to become a teacher? It look, looks to me from your resume that you were in real estate, in product management, management software, et cetera, and then you kind of did a 180 and went mm -hmm. to teaching. So, um, the short version is that I was working for a startup company at the time. It was during the um, dot-com boom. And uh, then there was a bust, and they went out of business. And I had been through, um, I had been in technology for a while, and I had turned down a lot of jobs to move to California. Things have sort of shifted again back east, but at the time that I was working in the business, it was more and more going to the West Coast. And I loved where I lived. I loved Brookline. I didn't want to move. And so, you know, when the, when the dot-com bust happened, 
you know, I, I realized that it was going to be a little while. I was in marketing as a product manager, and the typical scenario for marketing people is you do sales until the economy turns around and then you go back to marketing because <laughs> people are always willing to pay salespeople on commission. And, um, and I said, you know, this one's going to last a while, and I really don't feel like doing this every few years. And I really had no idea what I wanted to do, but there were a couple of things that were really important to me. One was that I felt as wonderfully as I got along with the people that I worked with, and um, as, as well as I got along with the people that I worked for, I felt like at the end of the day, there wasn't really much coming back other than a paycheck. So I would feel good about the products that I managed, and I felt good when they were successful, which they were, but I felt like I was doing more and more um, nonprofit work and volunteer work, and now that I look back on it, I think that's sort of built into me, and I didn't realize it at the time, but, but I, I said I wanted to work at a, in an industry that I felt like I was giving something besides generating dollars. So that was one. And then the other was that I'm pretty monogamous by nature, and I loved working at companies that I was at and got along really well with the people, and it was hard for me to make those transitions. So I was looking for a career that was both um, more satisfying in terms of the contribution I was making and was more stable. And I spent, I had no idea what I was going to do. I spent a summer going with a great career counselor who I found in Belmont. And at the end of the summer, I had three things that I was deciding between, and teaching was one of them, and I picked it. So, and it's been a great, it's been a great um, move for me. Yeah. Okay. One last question, um, and this isn't meant to be controversial. Okay. But as I'll a try to keep it that teacher, way. Um, how has your experience been uh, communicating with the administration, um, especially like during the 2014 override? I know that you you know helped out on that campaign. From a teacher's perspective and a resident of Brookline for so long. Do you think that uh, the information that we get for this kind of override study committee is reflective of, you know, the people that are actually in the classrooms? Is so. The last part was: is the information that the override study committee is getting reflective of the classrooms? Was that the last part? Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that there's no disconnect between like the teachers and the administration, and then the override study committee what we're given for uh, numbers and, and figures. I didn't know from your perspective yeah. if you've felt yeah. like in the past there's been a disconnect or if you uh, feel like there hasn't been a disconnect. Um, yes and no. I feel like um, one of the things that's been really impressive for me in making a career change, because my kids were in fifth grade and seventh grade when I started teaching, so I had been a, a Brookline parent well before I was a Brookline teacher. And I always really thought that the teachers here were really great. But when I started teaching, I had a whole new respect for how good they were. And the people that I work with are really phenomenal. And that goes for not just the teachers, but the administrators. Um, you know, I have, I've had some great administrators. And I feel like there's a lot of talent. Um, that Brookline has and a lot of really wonderful people that Brookline has. I think that the thing that has not been working as well um, has been not communicating as well as we should have. And I include, I think within the building it's not such a, such a problem, but I think from building to building and from building to town hall is not as good as it could be. And, you know, it's something that I'm really working on and I'm, I'm uh, very active in the union. I'm the vice president of the Brookline Educators Union, and this is something that I've talked to Andrew Bott about, and this is something that I've talked to Jessica Wender Shubo about. And you know, my my feeling about it is that none of us succeed unless we all succeed. 
that he's not going to be successful if the teachers and the schools aren't successful and the teachers and the schools aren't going to succeed and grow if he's not successful. And to me, the only way that happens is by communicating. You know, if there's something that we don't like or is not looking good or we think is a problem, we need to say something about it, not just keep it to ourselves and then, you know, be angry about it. And I think the same is true from the other direction. It doesn't mean that there's everything is always transparent 100%, but I think that that's the foundation on which we build the success of the school system. And I don't think we're there yet, but I, I think we can be. I mean, I think Andrew's a good listener and, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I think yeah. we need to move on. Okay, thank and again, you. thank you. I'm really sorry to add to your agenda. Okay. So we have some warrant article reviews and public hearings. So first, uh, we have the warrant articles from the senior tax policy committee headed by Selectman Franco. So uh, the first one is Article 6. Who's going to, someone want to talk about it? Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon. Good evening. Nice, nice to see you all. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll speak in my presentation, my prepared remarks on 6, 7, 8, and then we can discuss them in, in whatever order you might like. So I'm Neil Gordon, town meeting member, Precinct 1, member of the advisory committee, uh, member of the Selectmen's Committee on Senior Tax Policy, speaking for the Selectmen's Committee and not uh, applying to the Override Study Committee. <laughs> uh, we, all, we all know that living in Brookline is expensive and that real estate taxes will soon be subject to increases from uh, upcoming overrides and debt exclusion. Brookline seniors living on uh, fixed and often limited incomes are especially and increasingly vulnerable to economic forces, including overrides and debt exclusions. Accordingly, a year ago, town meeting adopted a resolution sponsored by Susan Granoff urging the Board of Selectmen to establish a committee to study property tax relief programs for senior homeowners with modest incomes. The Committee on Senior Tax Policy, chaired by Selectman Franco, was formed shortly thereafter. The Selectman charged the Senior Tax Policy Committee with making policy recommendations and proposing warrant articles, both for new programs and for improvements to existing programs. I speak this evening in support of three warrant articles that were filed as a result of the Committee's work. The Committee's final report, which contains additional recommendations, is being finalized and will be filed in advance of town meeting. Articles 6 and 7 relate to an existing Brookline real estate tax deferral program that under Massachusetts law allows qualifying seniors to defer the payment of their real estate taxes until they pass away or sell their homes. To be clear, this is a tax deferral program. There's no tax abatement and interest is charged on any taxes deferred. The cost of the town of administrating the program uh, is and will, even with the increased participation that we wish to encourage, remain nominal. First, Article 6. Article 6 asks the Board of Selectmen to petition the state legislature to increase the income qualification gap uh, from currently 57,000 to 86,000 by changing the reference in state law from the circuit breaker cap for single taxpayers to the circuit breaker cap for married taxpayers filing jointly as it applies to Brookline, so a home rule petition. These amounts are adjusted by the state annually for inflation. Favorable action on Article 6 would allow the town to pursue an action that would expand the number of seniors eligible to participate in the deferral program and given the high housing costs in Brookline, put in place an income ceiling that better corresponds to our local need. Separately, Article 7 proposes a change in the interest rate for seniors participating in the tax deferral program. Currently, participating seniors are charged interest at a fixed 5% rate on tax payments they defer. I'll note that the payment of interest is also deferred. No real estate tax or interest payments are made until the participant passes away or they sell their home. That would be the last participating survivor. Article 7 proposes changing the fixed 5% rate to a variable rate 
based on the 10-year United States Treasury bond yield, a rate that's currently about 2.2%. The rate would be adjusted annually for new deferrals. Favorable action on Article 7 would, at the current reference rate, reduce the cost of participation to senior ta of the, in the senior tax deferral program to one that the committee feels is fair to both the town and to participating seniors. Changes in the interest rate would roughly correspond to changes in the town's long-term borrowing rate over time, again, something the committee feels is fair to both the town and to participating seniors. The rate, although variable, would be capped under state law at 8%. And lastly, Article 8. The committee proposed adopting a program also defined by state law to fund tax relief aid to both qualifying seniors and, because it's included in the state law, those with disabilities. Favorable action on Article 8 would provide a voluntary supplemental payment through a tax bill checkoff. Funds, would be, funds raised would be administered by a taxation aid committee as provided in the statute. The taxation aid committee would be charged with establishing eligibility criteria and allocating any funds raised. As with the senior tax deferral program, there would be no tax abatement, no shifting of tax burden to other taxpayers other than voluntarily, and the cost of the town is expected to be nominal. On behalf of the Selectmen's Committee on Senior Tax Policy, I encourage a recommendation of favorable action on Articles 6, 7, and 8. Wow. So 6, six is a home rule petition um, to raise the, um, the income limit. Correct. From the current ceiling uh, up to a, uh, a higher ceiling. And uh, the, the current ceiling is based on a statewide average. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, apropos of the conversation we just had uh, about override study committee, this is a uh, more expensive community to live in than some others. Uh, and simply trying to get that income ceiling to better match the realistic cost of living in Brookline. Okay. Good idea. Yeah, really. What's our definition of senior in Brookline? What what age is the this mechanism? It's in the statute. The, the state definition, I believe, is fifty five. Is that, that correct, young? Neil? I, I don't know specifically. I don't remember. I don't the senior the circuit tax. breaker is that low. Yeah, I, I think oh. circuit breaker is sixty five. Sixty five. Okay. Um, but you're absolutely right. This, this isn't a, a, it's not a Brookline specific definition. Okay. This is a program that's uh, provided for in state law and the legislature is the one that gets to determine who's a senior and who's not. Okay. Um, yeah, these are, in my mind, pretty straightforward. Do so. we have an advisory no, committee? No, no, do we have an advisory committee recommendation? The on? advisory committee recommends favorable action on all three articles. Okay. Unchanged? Unchanged. Oh, my wow. goodness. <laughs> they didn't wordsmith a single thing? <laughs> huh. the, uh, yeah. the box to check, um, mm -hmm. do we currently have that? Do other communities have that? And do they just kind of say how much money they want to include? Yes. It's a very prescriptive uh, procedure uh, in the state law. So this, the city of Newton has it right now. I think that's the, the probably closest neighboring community. And how um, much do they usually get a year? Uh, 1200 It's not a tremendous sum of money. But, uh, but as uh, uh, Mr. Gordon has said in the past, uh, when you're having trouble paying your property tax bill, uh, 100 or 200 dollars is a meaningful, um, a meaningful contribution, and, and at the very least, a demonstration that the community feels your pain. Um, but I think, in addition to setting up uh, or allowing us to put this checkbox on the on the tax bill, it would also set up a committee. And I think there's an interesting conversation to be had mm. uh, at the committee level about what the ask looks like. Is it you know check to contribute one dollar? Uh, is it um, you know check to contribute a hundred dollars? You know, th there's some. 
it's going to be an interesting marketing effort um, in addition to a review of what we can actually do under state law. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there any members of the public who wish to speak? Mr. Caro. Hi. I'm, Are you for this? I'm Frank Caro. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct <laughs> 10. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, among other other things, uh, I'm uh, the chair of the Brookline Can Livable Community Advocacy Committee. I was also a member of the uh, of the committee that uh, that uh, that produced these these recommendations. And I'm I, and, 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 and first of all, I'll start by saying that the Livable Community Advocacy Committee unanimously uh, supports. Uh, all of these warrant articles, and you know, strongly <laughs> urges favorable action. I'm you know, I just, uh, you know, kind of like to add a, a, a word about it in, in saying that uh, uh, that that these these recommendations rep represent a very modest st step forward. I mean, they're you know very welcome and, and kind of really, you know, it's important for town town meeting to pass them. But but they are very modest steps. And that what's agree. attractive uh, about this is that this is an approach doesn't that does not get into the complicated questions about shifting the burden from one group to to another. You know, it really kind of starts out with the idea that at least in concept, the the tax deferral program is attractive. Uh, it, you know, it kind of, it, you know, what it's kind of, it says says to people, you know, if, you, if you've been living here in Brookline for a while, uh, and you know, your your own property, uh, you you you've had some appreciation in, in property value, and and what it does kind of the participation in the deferral program does it really allows that appreciation in property value to 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 help you in paying the taxes. Uh, one of the members of our committee, Harold Peterson, who, who is a pro professor of economics at uh, Boston College, uh, did some very in interesting analysis uh, showing us that uh, that that uh, people who participated in in the program, uh, you know, assu assuming that you know, looking kind of historically at the, at the way property values have increased in Brookline, people could uh, older people who qualify for the program. Uh, could could participate in it, pay pay no real estate taxes, and experience no loss in in the overall value of, of their homes. It's you know what what they're paying for paying for it is with the uh, the appreciation and, and value that we get in you know in, in living in Brookline. So that's I mean that's why it's so attractive to try to get more people. To participate in the, in the defer, deferral program, and the puzzle is that there are so so very few. So, the emphasis here is, is on trying to maximize the participation in the tax deferral program. It's some, something that we need to to try, uh, and, and, the, and the clearly limitations uh, to it. We're going to have to do do some other things in the future, but this is a valuable first step. Okay. Um. Did we notice this for a vote? We yes, did. we did. So do, do we feel comfortable voting? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I will move a favorable action recommendation for the three articles. Just do them all in one vote. Um, all those in favor of a favorable action recommendation, please say aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. Selectman Hamilton. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Okay. A little quicker than the advisory committee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I presume their vote was uh, pretty unanimous, or no? What was it? <laughs> Out of curiosity. No, I know. I've, I've hung around the advisory committee too much to make that assumption. Well, well Mr. Gordon gets the, uh, the specific numbers. I can say that there was broad-based support for Articles 6 and 7. Article 8, which is the, uh, the checkbox article, uh, was a little bit more uh, close. Really? 
Yes. Yeah. But it's voluntary. There was a sense uh, amongst members of the advisory committee that uh, A, it wasn't going to raise a meaningful sum of money. That so may or may not be true. Was it sort of worth it or not? And but it's two, not cost um, does it go far enough? So Well, we can argue about that. Uh, Article 6, uh, the Home Rule Petition, 19 in favor, 0 opposed, 3 abstaining. Article 7, 14 uh, in favor, 5 opposed, 3 abstaining. Article 8, 10 in favor, 8 opposed, 4 abstaining. Wow. Uh, okay. Selectman Franco said Article 8 uh, was thought to be not worth the effort for the nominal amount. And my response, my exact quote was, uh, in, or maybe an additional quote, a nickel's a lot of money when you don't have one. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to Article 9, which is a little different. And Article 9 would have us petitioning the uh, legislature to uh, grant us the ability to issue some more liquor licenses. So who's going to speak to that? I guess I will take it. Uh, let me go to the podium. Boy, uh, Selectman uh, Franco, you've been busy. I apologize. I was a little bit asleep at the switch. I thought I'd uh, have uh, somebody else helping me out, but uh, but I think I can um, navigate my way through this. So, uh, as this board knows, um, we are short on uh, on liquor licenses in in Brookline. Uh, there are, uh, I believe, six different categories uh, of liquor licenses that we can issue. Um, there are common victuals licenses which are the, the typical licenses we give to, uh, to restaurants uh, and those in bars, and those come in two flavors, uh, an all kinds and a, uh, a wine and malt beverage license. Uh, there are um, package store licenses, uh, you know, sort of self-explanatory, the, the liquor store uh, licenses, and again, uh, those come in uh, two varieties, malt and uh, wine and then all kinds. And then there's two... Um, uh, types of licenses which we as a board see less frequently, uh, in-holder um, and club licenses. Um, and uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I apologize, but we are short in a couple of those categories. Um, and this uh, article is an attempt to, um, to re-up to get a, a larger quota of licenses uh, in the on-premises, the, the CV license categories. Um, and uh, this article is drafted uh, to, to give two different types of licenses uh, or two different uh, categories of licenses, all of which would be geographically restricted. So the first set of maps that you'll see behind uh, the text of the article itself uh, refers to um, specific parcels in town. Um, and these parcels were arrived at by taking a look at the housing production plan, uh, at um, uh, economic development projects which have been approved uh, or, in, or in the pipeline. So here I'm thinking about the Cleveland Circle Hotel project uh, or the River Road project that, uh, that we dealt with uh, about uh, a year ago um, or the Waldo Durgan project which is uh, currently in, um, uh, in, in committee or the Holiday Inn project, another uh, project that's being studied. Um, and then there's uh, map four here is a uh, is a, a parcel out in uh, in South Brookline, right on the Newton border along uh, Boylston Street. That there's been some conversations about redevelopment in the out years. So this first sort of group of uh, of licenses are um, parcels where there is a uh, identified need for a liquor license, uh, or where we project a license to be needed potentially in the future. Again, these licenses are restricted based on tax parcel. Uh, and would not be transferable. So let's just take the Cleveland Circle um, uh, licenses as an example. Is that map, map one? That is map one, exactly. Um, so we could issue a, uh, a liquor license to an establishment that opened at Cleveland Circle, but unlike our current quota of licenses, we couldn't take that license and issue it to a business in Washington Square, uh, Putterham Circle, or Coolidge Corner. It's got to stay at that address. 
and to the extent that there isn't an applicant there, the license doesn't get issued. Do we have any such licenses today that we, are restricted we by do not. Okay. Um So this is a new animal. A new animal for Brookline. Do other communities have that? Yes. This is the way that the, the state legislature uh, currently prefers to issue these uh, additional licenses. I should maybe back up a step and say that the, the number of liquor licenses a community has, the quota, uh, is set by state law. Uh, and there is, in the interest of full disclosure, one community in the state, as I understand it, that does not have, uh, is not subject to the quota, and that dates back to uh, the 1920s, the, the end of prohibition. There was one community that did not accept a chapter of state law and uh, has a uh, uh, seemingly unlimited number of licenses. And who is that? Uh, it is a, a community on the other side of the Charles River. Uh, it begins with a C, ends in an E. Uh, <laughs> home of uh, two major universities and uh, has a lot of economic development going on. Um, <laughs> so that, um, and that, that, that quota so of licenses. So cryptic. Can't that, figure it out. That, uh, that quota of licenses, I believe, adjusts every 10 years based on population. So what we have today may change in the future um, based on the census. Um, so that's the first sort of group of licenses that would be uh, obtained should we go to the legislature and they approve this legislation. The second group of licenses, and uh, let me flip the page and get the map number. Um, the licenses referred to in uh, what's page 14 and 15 in our packet um, are uh, what are referred to as economic development opportunity areas. Uh, and those uh, are licenses where uh, we as a community, based I, my understanding is primarily on the housing production plan, have said, hey, there's some opportunity for, um, for development to occur here, and we just want to be ready uh, should uh, a project come forward that isn't handled by uh, the, the first, uh, what is it, the first uh, five maps in, in, in the article. Uh, I should uh, make quite clear here that uh, some of these uh, licenses are prospective. We're anticipating that there may be projects advanced here to the extent that a project doesn't materialize or a project materializes that doesn't need a liquor license, we are under no obligation to issue the liquor license. Uh, and similarly, um, if uh, a project does materialize, there's an applicant that comes before the board, the normal licensing procedure would take place and we, the Board of Selectmen or a future Board of De Selectmen, have the discretion to issue the license or not issue it and attach any conditions we deem appropriate. Um, particularly on the, the development opportunity area map, uh, you will note that there are some, if you get down to specific addresses, there are some funny things that go on. So you'll see some, uh, some areas that are shaded in gray that uh, aren't zoned currently for, um, for uh, uh, commercial. Uh, uh, I think somebody last night at a, at a hearing pointed out that uh, their home in a historic district is zoned, uh, uh, is on the map as a shaded in area. This is an imprecise map. And of course, to the earlier point I made that the board has discretion should we get this, these 40 licenses uh, on where to issue a license into whom. So um, I would encourage uh, all of us not to get caught up in the details here. We're simply trying to get a quota of licenses to allow for things to happen in the future. Uh, we're not saying that a license has to be issued to a particular address, a particular business, or in a particular area. Right, and of course the uh, underlying zoning would would take effect. So if if an area is zoned completely residential, uh, it, would, it would be a prohibited use. Yep. As I described last night, this is trying to set the table for good things to happen in the future. Uh, one of the problems that, um, that every community has in the state, all 361 of them, is that uh, you can only go back to the legislature every so often for an additional set of licenses. Uh, and that, that uh, waiting period in between is typically uh, over a decade. So again, to underscore the fact that we're trying to be forward looking here uh, and not wait for a particular project to materialize uh, and a need to uh, arise for a liquor license um, before going to the legislature, petitioning them and trying to get uh, that, that, uh, 
that supply of licenses. Just to be quite clear about what this article did, because I think I, I glossed over it, uh, we're looking for 35 um, uh, all kinds licenses uh, and five wine and malt licenses, of course, divided between those two categories that I laid out, the ones that are uh, based on specific addresses and then the second set looking uh, sort of a development opportunity areas. I, th I think it's the, the zoning point is an important one that we should make sure that it's in the write-up. Um, and when I'm presuming Selectman Franco is going to be speaking to this at town meeting. Um, He's the one who understands it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, because I, I, I think, you know, if you look at the development areas, you know, uh, in map 6A and 6B and then 6C, it's like, Okay, the whole town. So then you look at the map and say, well, you know, look at all these little residential streets. Uh, is Bar going to be opening up on the residential streets? And the answer is no. Uh, uh, they'll open the commercial areas in just the same way that they're opening commercial areas uh, now. So this is just allowing us to uh, uh, expand the, the licenses, and then we as a board tend to be very careful, and we obtain uh, uh, community feedback uh, as to what kinds of conditions and uh, we do stings and and you know we take our uh, uh, licensing and enforcement as a, as a as a town and as a board very very seriously and we listen to communities you know uh, you know when a butters come and testify before us and say uh, these hours aren't appropriate or we don't think uh, this um, this setup uh, for business is appropriate. We, uh, I at least take it very seriously, and based on my, you know, over three years on the board, I think uh, the board in general takes those comments seriously and um, and um, and weighs them very carefully when making a decision as to whether to issue a license and uh, what conditions to attach to it. I, I would make one suggestion, which is that on these maps um, that you identify precinct or you know area mm. or so that you know I can see myself kind of trying to look at the little tiny right trying to figure out yeah. which yeah. part of Brookline it is yeah yeah so I think that's a great suggestion if it would be helpful I can tick through the first uh, five or six maps and tell you exactly where they're referring to well, I, I think I've figured it out okay squinting and looking at the Cleveland Circle yeah. and then uh, River Road and uh, one Brookline, uh, the Brookline Place development. Yep. Right. And yeah. Coolidge Corner. And so then, map three is the Waldo Durgan Garage, in, right. right in Coolidge Corner. Uh, map four is uh, is out in South Brookline uh, at the um, uh, Chestnut Hill. Chestnut Hill. Uh, thank you very much. Right by um, uh, Hollywood Cemetery, out by the street. Um, map uh, five. Uh, refers to the the what is now the Holiday Inn uh, on Beacon Street um, and uh, then we get to these uh, development opportunity maps uh, 6a 6b and 6c uh, and so those for instance map 6a um, the border is um, on the left it's Harvard Street and then it morphs into Commonwealth Avenue oh no maybe that's all Commonwealth I'm sorry and uh, so that's all, a lot of that is already commercial, right? but Most of it is, yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the quality of this map uh, is not great. I think okay. um, we can uh, get a better map for the board to take a look at and have a better understanding. Yeah, uh, I, I will I simply, think... I'll simply say that it's based on the housing production plan and a robust public process that took yeah. place. Um, this is a... Well, oh, I have I have a couple of questions. One, <laughs> how do we become exempt like Cambridge? We don't. So th this is a <laughs> this is a question for for the experts in town. Uh, uh, I will sort of soft my shoe my way through the answer and say I don't believe that uh, that opportunity exists any longer. Uh, it was something that was available uh, now almost a hundred years ago, and we missed the boat, as did. Uh, 350 other cities and towns in Massachusetts. Bummer. Okay, then my second question is, do we have any club licenses in town? 
We do. Um, I believe uh, there is one club license issued um, VFW, to the VFW. Uh, and, and the club licenses, there is no quota. It's uh, seemingly, uh, you know, you can issue as many as you like, but there are certain businesses that qualify for it. So if you've got 100 VFW posts, then you can issue 100 licenses, but you can't take a club license and issue it to a, a regular bar or restaurant. So to me, club means like boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom. That's no? not how no. it's referred no. to. It's like a, a veteran or a oh. fraternal organization. Or the Sons of Italy. Man, or... I thought that I'd have a new place to go to on Saturday nights. <laughs> well, we have to be holes open. <laughs> You're a veteran, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think... Um, uh, you know, it's noticed for a vote. You know, we can. Uh, oh, it's a public hearing. Any member of the public wish to uh, speak? I see none. Um, I will anticipate the next question. What has the advisory committee done? Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, full committee has not taken it up. The subcommittee met last night uh, and adjourned without uh, taking a vote. And they were they were getting into the weeds and should there be. Uh, a license here and not there and mm -hmm. so we can um, take the bull by the horns and try to lead the advisory committee in a direction and take a vote if we like what this is or we can wait or okay. we, we can digest questions. Uh, any questions or, or concerns I should take a vote I, I, I think that uh, Select person Franco's um, point. That's going to be tough. <laughs> Governor. Point about, um, I told you I like Puba. Um, about looking forward and um, designating areas in town where we are, sus you know, we suspect the growth will happen. Might not. We don't have to issue the licenses. Yeah. It's completely up to us at that time, so depending upon the conditions. So I think based on that, I think we should go ahead and, and vote on this, and um, you know, I would urge just to vote favorable action. And I, I hasten to add that the, um, the Licensing Review Committee, which Selectman Green and I uh, uh, co-chair, um, took a look at this uh, before the warrant article filing deadline uh, and was okay with the direction. Uh, the committee uh, hasn't come together and offered a formal recommendation, but they did have the opportunity to um, fly spec it in uh, and uh, issue some comments about general direction, appropriate, inappropriate, and uh, was okay with the filing, and here we are today. I'm, I'm, I'm okay to vote. Um, if we can always um, um, we, can, we can always reconsider, and we are we as a board are the board proposing this, so uh, I think it's okay for us to try and lead by example. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't support it, who will? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think we as a board take um, the issuances of licenses very seriously and won't do so lightly. And we should signal that, uh, um, you know, the, having the additional licenses will give us, you know, an opportunity to have a more vibrant uh, community. So, uh, I'm for it. so um, I will move a uh, recommendation of favorable action on the uh, warrant article nine as written. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. Selectman Hamilton? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we have one more. We have, well, we have appointments, uh, so I'll turn it over to Town Administrator Kleckner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have three commission, board and commissions that are ready for appointment uh, this evening. The first is the Building Commission. We have one expiring term. Uh, the incumbent, Ms. Brzezlowski, is interested in reappointment, and there are no other applicants, so I will put Karen Brzezlowski's name out for the board's vote. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Now, on the planning board, um, we are looking this evening to, uh, to make two appointments. There are three uh, available slots, though, although we haven't interviewed an incumbent yet, so 
We thought, uh, given the need for the planning board to uh, fill up uh, their their ranks as we head towards town meeting, would be important. So we're going to take two. Um, you're going to vote for two, and um, uh, there is one incumbent. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to list um, the incumbent's name first, and then I'm going to list the others that um, are on the list uh, who are in this this phase of. Uh, uh, of interviews, we we interviewed three people long Could you ago. Give us the names. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to name Mark Cirillo's name, uh, Catherine Link, Carlos Rudejo, and James Carr, and we have to vote for two. So I will, um, I will call the call the names. Mark J. Zarillo. Aye. 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 Um, Catherine Link. Carlos Ridwayo. James Carr. Aye. Aye. Okay, so then uh, Mr. Carr and Mr. Zerillo will um, will be members for the next three years, three year term. And then uh, finally, we have the um, the uh, building. I mean, excuse me, the um, the zoning board of appeals. And in this case, um, we have um, two vacancies, but we haven't, um, and only incumbents are interested in reappointment at this point in time. We haven't uh, interviewed one of the incumbents, so we're just going to uh, reappoint uh, one member, and that um, that is um, actually and we're moving them up. Uh, to, yeah, actually, uh, the the vacancy is on the full members. You may be aware that on the zoning board of appeals, there are three full members and then several associate members. There really is no difference in um, in the role of those those people. They fill in. When, when needed. So, uh, but in this case, uh, we think Mark Zoroff, who is uh, who's up for reappointment as an associate member, uh, would be uh, appropriate to move up. So, I will call uh, Mark Zoroff uh, Aye. Aye. for a, for a permanent member for a term for three years. Thank you. Okay, and I think that concludes our business for tonight. Mm -hmm.